thank you. And also, we want to say uh, a thank you to Superintendent Carpenter for serving on the Superintendent's Council leadership team, which is a group of uh, superintendents that support um, Tony in, um, in setting the agenda and having some conversation and discussions with the superintendent. So thank you very much. Um, just a quick uh, overview um, for those who are uh, new to the um, to this year uh, local service plan adoption with um, with Elaine ESD uh, of the uh, 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 state school fund um, funding allocated to our region, 4.5% goes to, um, to the ESD. And of that, 90% um, of that revenue uh, goes right back to our local service districts uh, to support you. So by statute, we provide uh, services to our districts in four areas, uh, school improvement, special education, business, and technology. And, um, and so just a quick highlight on some of the things that you will see in, in this year's um, plan is um, we continue to support um, in special education with behavior consultant and FTE. And we have some students that were supported in our life skills uh, programs um, and augmentative communication as well. Uh, in the school improvement area, uh, we'll continue to support um, the district with the uh, Student Success Act and the Student Investment Account Plan, uh, some technical support with that, as well as um, any professional development that you might need. I believe that uh, the district is still taking advantage of the Skillful Teaching uh, Learning Academy, as well as tapping in some professional development with maybe restorative practices and trauma-informed care. Um, I also believe we have Shanae, uh, who is supporting our African American and Black Student Success Program, and some of our um, African American and Black students in in the in the region, as well as some CTE uh, programs. We have four new programs, I believe, and we will support with the certification of those teachers um, to get certified in um, in their CTE endorsement. Uh, there's some uh, same as last year with technology, internet, including email and some uh, ticket help desk, data warehouse, and any professional development that the uh, tech team might need. Um, in administrative support services, um, we still have the uh, support with substitutes and courier services. Um, coming soon uh, this year, um, there will be an integration reporting for the state plans. Uh, for two years now in response to hundreds of requests from educational and community leaders, folks at the ODE have been working towards aligning and integrating data for key statewide educational investments. And I don't know if Superintendent Carpenter, if you've had a, had a chance to have a conversation uh, with the board yet, but it's, it's fairly new. Um, the comprehensive guidance to be released this year will include an integrated approach to community engagement and needs assessments, assessments across the six initiatives. These are the high school success, um, student investment account, continuous improvement planning, um, career and technical education, um, everyday matters and early indicators. So is the intent is to um, integrate all these um, data reporting initiatives into, into one comprehensive um, plan. So um, this last two years, ODE has been collecting uh, feedback from multiple stakeholders around the state, and they're now finalizing, uh, laying out the information for final distribution in the next few weeks. So once it comes out, um, the ESD will be providing firmage with the technical assistance with new accountability, uh, integrated data reporting, which hopefully will make our lives a little bit easier and we'll have to be reporting on individual initiatives. And so, um, so we have the, the, um, the um, plan, um, the local service plan has been approved um, by the Superintendent's Council. Um, it was approved on November 16th, and our Lane ESD board um, approved it in December 7th. And so we're seeking the approval from our component districts for March 1st. So that's the, um, and I believe that um, our director Kissinger from the Lane ESD, it may also be on the line. So I don't know if we give her a chance to say hello.
Did you see her? I don't believe. There she is. Hi, Sydney. Go ahead and unmute your mic, yeah. You have to unmute or do we have to give you permission? There she is. Okay, I've I've, I have unmuted, how are you? We're good, how are you? Doing well. And uh, I am pleased to be here to meet the, the school board and say hello. Introduce myself as Sydney Kissinger on the Lane ESD board. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, do you, I, I, I hope I, to see you again other time, maybe in person soon. <laughs> maybe in person soon. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Mm -hmm. Is there more to the presentation? I know we had access to these via email. The only thing I'd mention, uh, well, A, Carlos, thanks for coming, sharing many things yes. uh, that the ESD supports us with. Uh, one other thing that I'd mention is uh, this year we've been working a lot, especially uh, uh, Ms. Marshall with the SEL team at the ESD with uh, Daniel and Angela, uh, Leah yeah. and Cassidy, our equity folks. Um, yes. Are, are some other people that uh, we've been spending some time with. So they, they definitely help help us here in Fern Ridge immensely. Absolutely. Thank you. So thank you. Do I need a motion on the entire thing or? So I'll make a motion to approve the okay. plan and resolution number 21-22 slash 01 as presented. And I'll second, this is Barbara. Hi, Barbara. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, I will call a vote. Uh, if you would raise your hand, use the raise hand function um, if you oh, no. say aye. All right. I can say aye. <laughs> motion carries five to zero. Is this both, was that both parts or do we need to look at the second part? Hey, I included the plan and the, and the resolution. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Um, Thanks, so then, Carlos. Thank you thank so you. much, Carlos. Thank you, uh, Sydney. It was nice to meet you both, as such as it were. Oh, and I have to lower my hand. You're both welcome to stay on, but I understand you have other things to do that are probably more, uh, more pressing. So but feel free to stay on if you'd like. Thank you, and thank you for putting this item up in the beginning of the agenda. Much appreciated. <laughs> Have a good evening. You too. You too. Um, thank you. And, thank uh, you. So much. Hope to see you all in person one day. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. Have a good meeting. You as well. You too. Well, you, I have a good, you have a good, good evening. evening. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to stay and have a good what? meeting. <laughs> I can stay on. Is it important enough that I should? Um, oh, no, I don't know that there's, I mean, I like to think that the work that we do is very important, but I don't know that there is anything that would warrant you yes. to your evening with Fern Ridge. <laughs> okay. All okay. right. Well, thank you and have a good meeting. And I look forward to reading the minutes and looking into it after it's finished. That sounds great. The recording will be available too, if you, if you find that you have some time to kill. Okay, thanks. Okay, Thank bye-bye. Have a good night. You too. All right, moving on. We have public comment submitted and I think we have somebody to import. Yeah, I think we had, um, let's see. We had three total public comments. Uh, two folks used our new, uh, our new form. Uh, but we'll kind of we'll include all three comments this month uh, and hopefully just continue to work on folks um, using this submit form process. Uh, but I think the first uh, two are for us to be read and one is in person. I think Michelle will pull that person into our webinar.
Okay, I think uh, Jessica, sorry, it was giving me some trouble, but I think Jessica's in now and she can, she can speak. Jessica, there you Am go. I, on mute. Thank you. Am I good to speak? Sorry, I didn't know I had to join the panelists. I'm kind of new to Zoom. Yep, you're good we, to go, Jessica. You're, you're good to go. It's a learning curve for all of us. So go right ahead and speak when you're ready. Perfect. First off, I'd like to thank you all for your time. I know that we're in an incredibly hard time and we're all trying to navigate it. Um, I've been in communication with Gary and I think unfortunately our community has a lack of involvement, which I would love to see change. Um, when I go to the games, when I go to things at the school, I don't know if it's COVID that's disconnected us, but we've definitely become disconnected as a community. And I, I think we need to see that change. Um, we can all agree that we haven't lost lives in this community and at our schools to COVID this year. We've lost lives at our school due to suicide. And that to me, it just, it, it crushes my heart and my inner being knowing this is a problem we have. And it's something that we're, we need to make better. I get that we wanna follow 4J and follow these other large communities. We're not a large community, we're a small community. And we need to come together and start doing what's best for our children. Um, as I appreciate the board, I know you guys volunteer your time and anybody who volunteers, I really respect. It's become evident um, being at meetings and looking over the recordings. I know it said when Gary put it out that the board wants to meet in person. I have seen stuff very contrary to that comment. Um, the board doesn't want to meet in person from what I've seen. And as I understand, we're all living different lives. And I, I understand some of you may be in fear of this. And it's a fear that I believe our state's pushing on us because if we go to other states, what we're dealing with here is not something. Um, I would question if this is a, a position you can't hold and you can't fulfill because of things in your life, maybe it's time to resign. I also find it hard that there's members of the board that take their kids to another district. And I feel like if our district was doing what it needed to do, members of our board wouldn't do that. And so it's something I would like the board to reflect on. If this isn't the position for you right now, then maybe we need to relook at that and start doing what's best for our community. Um, I'm also told that I'm in the small percentage of people who feel really passionate about keeping sports open. I feel passionate about getting the masks off our kids so our kids can lead a normal, healthy life. There's other school districts in the state pushing this. And it, I'm questioning, are we going to the community? Are we going to the parents? And are we asking those hard questions? What does our district want? It's not what I want. And I, and I understand the district might not align with what I want, but it also might not align with what you want. We need to find out as a district what we want. I don't know if that comes together in surveys, if it comes together of people meeting, I don't know the best thing for that, but I think it's time to start reaching out and, and diversing some change. I would also like to say I'm incredibly thankful to see sports still going because I do believe when it comes to mental health in our kids, having an outlook and having something not only keeps them healthy, they're on the healthier percentage of children when they're out being active, doing those things, getting exercise, getting fresh air, getting all that, it also keeps them healthy in their mind. It gives them a team, it gives them friends, it gives them camaraderie, something these kids have been missing for two years. And we need to continue that, not just in sports, but in things like band, um, different community involvements, things um, that are important for them. As a parent, it's really hard to know that Parents can't walk their kids to class. Parents can't volunteer. Parents can't go to these things that are so important to be involved in their kid's education and their kid's life. But then we'll open it in the weekends for sports and for games. I can't go into the high school and meet with a teacher, but I can go there at four o'clock to watch my son play basketball. As a parent, that's really hard for me to understand. Um, I feel like these teachers are there every day on the front lines teaching. I don't think they have a problem meeting with us. I think if you ask the majority of elementary teachers, they would love to have volunteers back in their classroom. That is Jessica, what helps I'm, those classrooms I'm run. I'm sorry. 
we are now uh, at three and a half minutes and we do have to be fair and allow three minutes for everyone. Do you wanna just wrap that up really quickly? Yes. Okay. I, I would just, I would like to see us come together and, and make some changes there um, and getting the, the, the involvement back in to being in person. And like I said, I'd like to thank you all for your time. And I hope that as a community, we can start doing better for our kids. Thank you for your time and for your comment. I appreciate that very much. Um, okay, our other, I'll just comment really quickly on a, you know, typically just to remind folks in our board meeting, um, the board wants to hear comments and, you know, as long as like Jessica did there, well, everyone's got different opinions. As long as they're shared respectfully, we do this for as many people as that want to do it. Um, but I did, so just to follow up, I do want to touch on just a couple of things she said. I think we are going to start looking into possibly doing some surveys. We'll keep you posted. I don't know what that information uh, will tell us or how we'll use it, but stay tuned. The other thing I want to, because I hear this a lot, just to address really quickly, this issue of after school and in school. And again, uh, what we're doing is following state requirements. And what they say, because I asked the same question too, uh, Jessica just asked, the, the primary difference there is Gary is a eighth grader and my parent, um, it's compulsory. Me attending school is compulsory, it's required. So during the school day, we have to have, there's different requirements because kids are required by law to go to school than there is after school when it's my choice if I wanna to go to a basketball game or a soccer game. So that is the primary difference there in regards to that. All right, thanks, Jessica. We had two other comments. I'll read them. Uh, I'll try to read them quickly. Uh, let's see. Dear members of the Fernridge School Board, we, the Fernridge Community Alliance, we're hoping to introduce ourselves today during the in-person school board meeting. Unfortunately, you've assessed and decided to stay virtual again, considering there is no ability for live in-person public comment and reading submitted letters are required to be under three minutes. These limitations make it almost impossible to express our concerns. We feel the need for public comment during these unprecedented times are more due and more due diligence from you, the elected leaders of our school to us as a community. There are many parents, community members and students who feel their questions and concerns are being widely ignored and suppressed. We ask now for all of you to address and acknowledge the following questions. One, will you continue to implement a vaccine mandate for both current and former staff, including parents who are currently uh, still not allowed on school grounds following the Supreme Court ruling against the vaccine mandate with state government overreach, or will you continue with the current policy and require boosters? Uh, two, why do you have teachers implementing their own mask rules into classrooms, which go above and beyond the requirements implemented by our governor? Are parents aware of this? Three, why do you allow teachers to punish students when their masks fall beneath their noses, especially during PE, knowing this violates the current mask mandate rules, which say specifically against punishment to students? Four, why is it okay to spend COVID relief money intended for our school on massage chairs for staff when the middle school furnace is currently not functioning properly and has been inadequately working all winter? Or addressing the air filters, which haven't been changed in over three months. How do you justify that type of spending? Five, in the, is the current maintenance staff able to meet the needs and upkeep of the school? There's an obvious trash problem on campus along with general upkeep. Uh, are these needs being addressed? Do you need to hire more staff? We'd be requiring a six. We'd be requiring or asking staff or students to wear KN95 masks now or in the future. We offer correct training courses for the use of these masks if required, knowing there's warnings on the label against use for children and toxicity implications. And seven, what vaccine requirements will be added for staff and students next year? Will there be an exemption offered? Considering there was not an exemption offered for staff to remain on campus this year, there is an exemption offered to students next year will be available for staff as well. These are just a few of concerns and questions from the public. We'll have a duty to address them. We would appreciate if you would take a few minutes during the board meeting to respond. Thank you, Burnridge Community Alliance. You want me to touch on any of those briefly, Dr. Povenmire Kirk? Well, Superintendent Carpenter, they all are day-to-day -day operations, which Oregon School Board Association has made very clear does not fall under the responsibility of the school board. So I think you're yeah. the best person to address them. Well, and kind of like I mentioned before, you know, I'll be super brief here. The first thing I'd say, we could you know, talk for 10 or 20 minutes probably on each one of these. Anybody that wants to have a conversation with me, um, I'm always available. And uh, I would imagine like our, our last speaker, Jessica, who gave me a call a week or so ago, 
uh, and we spend over an hour on the phone. Um, I'll meet with anybody. I'll talk with you on the phone. I'll email you um, if you have questions. But all of the things in here, I would agree, are not under school board uh, purview. Uh, our district sets board policy. None of these are in board policy. Um, but I'll go through it real quick. And again, this is going to be super brief, I hope. Uh, if you want more information on any of these, give me a call, set up a meeting, shoot me an email. Um, I guess the first thing I'd touch base is on uh, would be the comment that, um, uh, let's see, reading and submitting letters required to be under three minutes. These limitations make it almost impossible to express our concerns. Um, this has always been what it is. Uh, school board meetings have public meetings, which means they're held in public. They're not to engage in dialogue with the public. And so the public can watch the work of the school board. And um, some boards, ours included, allow for public comment. Uh, and now that with this new policy, we instead of it being more restrictive, we've actually made it less restrictive. Not only can folks do like Jessica did here, uh, come in virtually. When we meet in person, they can come in in person. Or like this group did, they can just send an email, ask it to be read, and we'll read it. So, you know, I work at night on school board meeting nights at 630. I can never come in person, which all is all it ever used to be. This would never be able to happen. So we've actually expanded the way uh, people can, can, uh, can participate in these meetings. Uh, we have, I don't know how many people here tonight. It looks like 33. I can't think of the last board meeting. In five years, we've had 33 people. That's because we're doing it virtually. And, uh, um, you know, this many people uh, hopefully it continues. They stay engaged and watch this way. Okay, really quickly, let's see. Number one, vaccine mandate. As long as there's a vaccine mandate required for staff, yep, I assume we'll be continuing to follow all the best practices. Uh, the, the deal about um, folks on student grounds, just before winter break, we had started to work on, and we have it actually completed. We're continuing to, to massage it um, to be able to transition to kind of two things. One, allowing vaccinated volunteers, parent volunteers. Two, unvaccinated parents to also have access to the school in a way that would they would never be a close contact. So that what a close contact is, is continuing to change and evolve, and it might change and evolve more uh, in the, over the next month or two. Uh, but um, our hope is, obviously, now is not the best time across the state. We have more students and families affected by COVID, but we hope to get there soon, and we're working on it. Number two, teachers implementing their own mask rules. Not aware of this, teachers should be following. Every mask rule should look the exact same in every classroom. There's a concern with specific uh, spot. Start with the teacher. If you don't get the right answer, um, chat with the principal. Uh, students being punished. Again, shouldn't be happening. Uh, I, and I don't know that it is. So if you think that that's occurring in PE, um, it's somewhere particular, uh, let us know. Definitely not something we want uh, would support. COVID relief money intended for school used on various things like a massage chair. I don't know that we've purchased a massage chair, uh, but if a school had ordered one for their staff, I probably would have signed the purchase order. The Our teachers currently, um, their lives look different. Our staff's lives look different. When elementary students come to school in the morning at 7.30, they used to go to the cafeteria, the gym. Now they're immediately in their teacher's room when their day starts, they don't have time to prep. They're covering other teachers that are out because their kid school is closed in Eugene um, and that teacher's home. They're covering uh, other staff duties during their prep time because one of our own staff members is out. And so the single most important thing that our board, my, myself and all our administrative team has been focused on is offering in-person instruction. In-person instruction um, is the key requirement uh, for our use of care dollars. How can we support that? As you might have seen throughout the state, and I'm spending a little more time on this, but it's important, and not only the state, but Lane County, many districts have implemented work relief days for their staff, meaning, hey, one day a month, we're not gonna have school, so teachers can get caught up to recover some of this time that they're losing every day. In our district, I met with our association, they agreed, um, our labor unions, that the most important thing we wanna continue every day, as we've been able to so far this year, we have not closed school once for any health-related or COVID-related issue. Not that it might not happen, but to this point, we haven't. 
um, they agreed that that's most important. So what are some things we can do to help the health care wellness of our staff to encourage them to keep going uh, till June? Some of those things. Um, so we came to some agreements, for example, on uh, we're limiting the amount of professional development or shorten, trying to shorten staff meetings. We, um, I bought uh, some of our wellness money, our district wellness money, not CARES money. We bought each staff room a new water dispenser and have water delivered so they can have hot or cold water throughout the day. Little things. One of the things we did, I did, was allocate each building of our over $5 million of COVID money, um, $5,000 to each building to spend in a way that they thought would support their staff, um, health and wellness, let them know they're appreciated, that we thank them for all the things that we're doing. So all I would say to that is if a middle school said, hey, our staff really wants a thousand dollar massage chair, I'd say go buy two. Question number five, uh, current maintenance staff. Um, we are understaffed in the maintenance department. Do we need more staff? Yes, luckily we just hired one. Uh, we were down two, now we're down one. Uh, I do believe we have enough staff to keep up, but just like all of our staff, they're being taxed. Um, we'll be requiring staff for students to wear in KN95s. I don't ever see that. I don't see the state mandating it. Um, so I don't see that happening. Vaccine requirements. Um, if they're added for students next year, uh, well, first of all, if the mandate goes away from staff, it'll go away for our staff. Uh, if it stays, it'll stay for our staff. Um, for students, if Everyone that I've talked to, and I've talked to some higher ups, they're actually on the committee that add vaccines to the student exemption list. And they said, oh, there is a chance it could get on there. It's a long process, but if the, it does, unlike for the staff vaccination that where there's only religious or health exemptions for student vaccinations, there's a personal exception. And we have many students in our district now that have followed that process and got an exception for a required vaccination, measles, whatever. Um, and everyone I've talked to said that a COVID-19 vaccine, if required, would be on that list and staff, uh, excuse me, students um, and families could make the choice whether to vaccinate their student or not. All right, I touched on those all real briefly. Again, they're complicated issues that take more than 30 seconds each, but if anyone wants to uh, explore any of them more with me, feel free to give me a call or reach out. Oh, sorry, last comment. Uh, third comment um, to the Fernridge School District School Board. This is from Eric Carlstrom. I wanted to send you a quick note of appreciation for all you do for our schools and our children. The challenges of the pandemic have been great as well as the pressures being directed towards yourselves. From the beginning, you've had some difficult choices to make, but I believe that you've made those choices for the good of all of our children, teachers, IAs, as well as other staff within the school district. I want to thank you all for your service to this community on the school board and for, and for continuing to make wise decisions. Thank you. And those were our three comments for today. Thank you. Um, moving right along, monthly items, minutes from last month for board approval. Can we make it bigger? I've seen it, I just can't read it now. There we go, thank you. I'll make a motion to approve December 20th, 2021 minutes as presented. I'll second that, this is Andrew. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, I call a vote. All in favor, raise your Zoom hand. Uh, Motion uh, passes five to zero. Don't forget to lower your Zoom hand, like I always do. Um, moving back to the agenda. We have reports, the enrollment report. Kwana, take it away. Hello. Hello. Thank you. 
Thanks, Michelle, for bringing it up. This is our enrollment numbers as of January 1st. Currently, um, we are down 86 students from our budgeted numbers. We're down 35 from where we were last year. That's for total in-district enrollment. Um, and that 86 comes from 28 at the elementary level, 22 at the middle school level, and 36 at the high school level is where that 86 um, decrease is coming from. Um, that's about all I have on the enrollment report. It's kind of staying steady every month. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Not decreasing a lot, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. Any questions? Yeah. But if anybody has questions or wants any more type of numbers, I'm happy to provide those to you. Just let me know. Thank you, Kwana. All right, moving forward. And that does not require a board action. That's just for us. That's correct, yeah. That's correct, okay. So moving forward, it's still you, Kwana, for the yeah. uh, report. I All have right. a couple things, so yay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is the general fund financial report as of December 31st. We have received 70% of our budgeted revenues. Last year at this time, we had received 76%, um, but that was because we had received a large state timber revenue um, that was not anticipated in our budget. Um, so that's why last year we were higher at this point. Um, generally, we are around 70%. Our operating expenditures are sitting at 33%. That's the same exact percentage we were at last year at this time. Um, I am waiting for our official hard copy audit to plug in our beginning fund balance um, and our revenues will go up a little bit at that point once that's done. Um, so hopefully next year or next month, I'm sorry. Better be before next year. <laughs> okay. Questions, comments, or discussion? I move that we accept the general fund revenue and expenditure report as written. And I'll second, this is Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, I call a vote. All in favor of accepting the financial report, uh, raise your hand. Motion carries five to zero. Don't forget to lower your hand. All right, and the financial audit, which is also Quana. Yeah, so hopefully you all received that via email. Um, I've also uploaded it to our website so you can take a look at it there. Um, I still have not received the hard copies yet or the governing body communication, which kind of summarizes everything, but I will get that out to you as soon as it's received. Um, they hope to get it to me sometime this week, I was told. Um, so the audit though was finalized the last week of December and it was sent to ODE on time. It's due to ODE by January 3rd every year or they suspend your funding. So um, we made it barely. They're, they're running very behind doing all these audits virtually. It's, I think it's very difficult. Lots mm -hmm. of scanning you know, for the districts, lots of uh, scanning through documents on the computer instead of just having those hard copies in front of you. Um, we received an unmodified option on the basic financial statement, which means they gave a clean um, opinion with no reservation. They found no exceptions or issues requiring comment, no issues of non-compliance, and no questions on costs for the federal awards, um, which they spent a lot of time on federal awards this year. <laughs> and no new accounting policies were adopted. Um, our exit memo consisted of two best practices that are always listed on our report and are very common for school districts. The first one being that our cash balance exceeds our fidelity insurance coverage of 500,000, 
We've looked into increasing that in the past. It's very expensive to do it. Um, most school districts do not because of that reason. The second best practice listed was for more frequent changing of our passwords for our counting system. Um, that is something that PowerSchool is in charge of, not the district. So that is something they would have to change um, in their system. And I, I do believe they are working on that, but at this time that has not taken place. Although our district does require us to change our login passwords annually. So that does help some. Um, so I won't pull up the whole audit, but big picture, um, our general fund ending balance was around 4,665,000 or 29% of our total general fund revenue. We underspent our general fund operating expenditures by roughly 13%. So we ended pretty well for 2021. Um, I suspect we will have you know, a fairly large underspending this year as well. Uh, so, at the end, we have all these ending fund balances, and in order to establish policies for fund balances, um, I have to have you adopt, adopt this resolution. So, adopting this resolution will accept the audit report, um, as well as approve designating these committed fund balances to the required funds. And they are list, if you can scroll down, there you go, keep going, it's on the second page. So these are all of our committed fund balances. So proving this, um, what this does is it says these funds can only be sent, spent on these items. And these are all special revenue, um, except for the debt service fund down there, which is a 300 fund. Um, nothing really new. Um, we do have the wellness fund in there. That's kind of new. I don't think we had that last year, but that basically can only be spent on wellness. Um, other than that, they, those are all on there every year. And that is all I have, unless you guys had any questions on the audit, if you um, took a look at it. Um, the auditors are also welcome to, you know, answer any questions you may have that I may not be able to answer. I can email them, they can email you. Um, we can also bring them into a board meeting if needed. So I just want to confirm that the debt service fund is only $32? That's the carryover balance. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So we need an, a, a motion to approve the resolution 212202. I move that we approve resolution number 21 22 slash 02. And Barbara approve, um, seconds that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? Hearing none, I call a vote. All in favor, raise your hand. All right, motion carries five to zero. Don't forget to lower our hands. Thank you, Michelle, thank you, Kwana. Yeah, and please do send me an email if you would like a hard copy and I can get that in the mail to you. Okay, I'm I'm good, but thanks for that okay, information. Great. And, uh, mm -hmm. I'll, if if any board members are like, where can I get a hard copy of that? I will definitely direct them your All right, way. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, moving on to item seven and uh, reports. Applegate Regional Theater. Hello. Um, Applegate Regional Theater has had many of the problems that nearly everyone else has had during the pandemic, um, but that doesn't mean we've been idle, far from it. Um, we had our outdoor concert series on the fields last summer. We received grants from the Oregon Arts Commission and Lane County Cultural Coalition to build a mobile stage outside 
and to purchase a 30 by 30 foot cover to protect it. And then we had bands and other performers come out and entertain audiences during the summer in safe outside environment with them sitting inside or next to their cars. And it gave people a live audience experience where it was sorely lacking for a long time. Um, the last time I was here, we were just starting our local history mural project. Um, it was funded by a grant from the Oregon's Arts Commission. Jerry Ross, who is an internationally known artist who lives in Eugene, was our designing artist. He researched and created 14 panels, each showing a different aspect of Fern Ridge history, uh, from Native Americans through settlement and development to industry and the dam, up to the present time with wineries and, of course, the theater. Um, we had 27 different painters, including eight youth, uh, colorize Jerry's designs during August and September. Um, then we mounted them on the east side of the main building along the, the central roadside, covering the windows. Um, 58 people showed up for the unveiling on a wet and blustery October day. So we considered that a real success. Um, we gave them all a booklet that we had written with pictures of each mural panel and a description of each of the panel elements. Um, and this information was also shared verbally at the unveiling. Um, we got operational support grant from the Oregon Community Foundation and the Oregon Arts Commission. Our Reader's Theater Troupe rehearsed weekly during late summer and fall. A couple of performance engagements fell through because of COVID, but uh, Solvang retirement brought a busload of people out to the theater to see the murals and be entertained by our Reader's Theater Troupe, and they loved it. Um, later in December, we had our 2021 holiday show with Reader's Theater, two musical groups, and a holiday sing-along. And uh, everybody stayed socially distant, and a good time was had by all. It was the first time we'd had a public audience in the theater in two years. Um, KOCF radio station recorded the show and broadcast it twice, once on uh, Christmas Eve and once on Christmas in the afternoons. Um, now we've started planning for our 2022 summer concert series on the fields. We're going to have at least two concerts a month from May or June, depending on weather, uh, through September. And there will be variety of musical genres as well as some spoken word events and as many as possible featuring local Fern Ridge talent. We'll be collaborating with uh, local groups to put on the best shows possible. Uh, KOCF is also going to be partnering with us on that. And they'll probably be recording some of the con some or all of the concerts and airing them on the radio. So that'll be cool. Um, we're also planning on starting a youth readers theater this winter. This will involve youth from eight to 18, learning and rehearsing a variety of stories and plays, which will promote literacy, build self-esteem and team building, and just have fun. Um, we hope they will be able to learn we hope they will be able to perform at their schools and uh, in retirement facilities at the senior center and on our stage this summer outside. Um, other available rooms on the campus are still rented to other arts and youth mentoring nonprofits, Applegate Art Guild, Studio 7, and the West Eugene Boxing Academy. Um, we really thank you for the opportunity to continue our community involvement in, with uh, having the property. Thank you so much, Vicki. I was trying to take notes and I just couldn't quite type. Or, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm taking notes, but I, I couldn't <laughs> quite uh, write fast enough there. We're doing um, so, a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you guys have been, have been busy. Um, do any other board members have any questions? Nope, I just want to thank you for being a community asset. We hope we are. We're trying. <laughs> it's hard these days. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard. It's just hard these days, right? Like yeah. in, in general, every single person that I know is going through their own struggle here. So yeah, and and nonprofits yeah. these days are just we're all struggling. Yeah. Oh, I know. Absolutely. Well, thank thank you for uh, for your work to try to bring art and keep it vibrant in our community. Um, <laughs> 
moving forward. Thank you for being here, Vicki. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. We have Elmira High School here for a presentation. I think I saw Rick on here. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, uh, first off, I would just like to you know we're uh, we're always lucky enough to be the school that gets to present first. Um, I'm sure that was Gary's doing uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, when he was filling both roles and wanted to uh, get the, his presentation over with. But um, one of the things that, that actually we're really fortunate to be able to get to do is uh, we actually get the opportunity to uh, do this during school board appreciation month. So um, just first and foremost, thank you so much for um, all that you do. We appreciate um, all your time and effort for our students. Um, uh, we really just appreciate everything uh, that you do for our kids and for supporting our our staff as well. So um, thank you so much for, for volunteering your time and for all of your good work. So, uh, and uh, let's, we'll just go ahead and dive right in here. Um, uh, mission statement for Elmira High School. Um, you know, really it's about um, helping our students become successful members of this, of our global society. Uh, we really wanna make sure that they have an opportunity to, um, as graduates of Elmira High School, um, move out into the, into the world and, um, be positive contributors. Um, building goals, I'm sorry, that's off, off by year. I'm sorry, building goals for 2021. Um, you know, we really, one of the things that we worked really hard on uh, here in the last, just, just last year in particular, as we were virtual most of the year, was trying to figure out how to make sure that we, that our students were maintaining um, good attendance, uh, that our ninth graders were on track for graduation, um, and uh, that the students that were struggling um, we were able to find ways to assist them and move them um, along as the, you know, particularly this year. So building goals for this year, one, um, you know, was we'd really like with um, school back in session, uh, I'd like to see our attendance averages improve by 10% over last year's numbers. Our numbers actually were really um, pretty solid last year. Our attendance numbers still um, were above 92%. Um, but they've typically hovered somewhere closer to uh, 94 to 95%. And so we wanted to make sure that we were somewhere back within that um, uh, area with students returning uh, to campus um, full-time beginning in uh, September. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that uh, we made some significant strides with our ninth grade on track. Um, as you can see there from the, from the data, um, we've had two or three years that were down a little bit. Um, particularly last year um, at only 71% uh, ninth grade on track, which was not what we wanted to see. Um, and so we'd like to see that number uh, closer to, we're looking at about 82% is what we're hoping for. Um, and uh, in a later slide, I'll show you kind of where we, how we compared to the state, but 71% is certainly not what we, uh, what we wanted to see uh, last year. And then uh, a big one, this was really a big, a big push for us is, um, you know, we had a lot of kids uh, who struggled um, from the time that we closed uh, until the time that we opened last year uh, or back in March of, of, uh, of 2021. And what, what we found is that we had a lot of kids who, who um, for lots of different reasons, uh, support at home, um, access to technology, access to uh, the internet at their house. We had lots of kids that it was just a struggle for them to engage with us in school in, in any fashion. Um, and so we had kids that, um, you know, that are juniors now that were doing great their ninth grade year. And last year was really largely in a lot of ways a lost year for them. And we had lots of students that last year in many ways was a lost year for them. And so trying to figure out ways to reconnect with those kids, especially now that they're back here in, um, in person with us, um, what are some ways that we can get those kids back on track? Um, we have, uh, 12th graders in particular, that's kind of the one of the biggest focuses um, that we have right now is how many of those 12th grade students that kind of that we kind of lost last year for many different reasons, how can we figure out ways to help get them back on track and graduated with their class here in um, in June of 2022. So we're spending quite a bit of time on whether it's additional classes for those students, whether it's finding options for them through uh, um, work study, lots of different ways that we're looking uh, to try to find ways for those students to get credit 
um, to try to get them back on track. And the same is true for our 10th and 11th graders too, looking at those students who are behind, how do we find ways to, to get them credits so that when the school year is over, we can get them back on track uh, to graduation. So really trying to get about 20% of those kids is the goal um, with obviously the goal to do, to do more than just the 20%, but knowing that we have lots of kids who are still struggling with um, some of the, some pandemic related issues as well, just trying to find a way to help those kids um, get back on track is a, really a huge, huge goal for us for this year. Uh, just a quick picture of the building. Again, that's uh, EHS uh, this year. It's been that way for uh, quite some time. Um, and so uh, what's new? So we have several new staff members um, and uh, some of them are very, very new. Um, uh, hires that just happened within the last couple of weeks. Um, so uh, Ian Cooper uh, uh, continues the a long, strong tradition of uh, Cooper uh, men uh, teaching in our school district. So Ian is uh, our new SPED teacher, uh, just hired um, a week and a half ago. He's already off and running and doing a great job. Uh, Ashley uh, Haig is a SPED IA uh, for us, also somebody that we hired recently, um, you know, in, during the uh, beginning of the, or prior or after the beginning of the school year. Uh, Bo Heiberger, uh, again, another recent hire. Bo's been in the classroom just for a couple of weeks uh, teaching health. Uh, and doing a really, really good job. Bo's a uh, Elmira graduate. And uh, one of the things that he felt like he wanted to do after high school, after graduating college um, was looking at, to give back to um, his community. Uh, Ricky Hewling is our uh, new assistant principal. We hired her um, last spring and she's been with us since uh, August. She's been a tremendous asset to me. Uh, does a great job working with and communicating with our students. She's just a super, um, uh, individual and just doing a really, really great job with our kids. Tessa Slager is another person that we hired mid-year. Um, I'll be honest with you, I am, I feel extremely fortunate that we've been able to hire the quality of people that we have um, in the middle of the school year. That's really, in a lot of ways, it's almost unheard of that, we're, that, um, that we've been able to get some of the people that we've gotten mid-year. And uh, Tessa is another one. She's uh, took over um, for uh, Nicole McClaws as our media assistant, and she's just been um, outstanding. Uh, Court Worth, uh, we hired him as a counselor. Uh, and we've got uh, two full-time counselors now at the, uh, at, the, um, at the high school, which is really a, a, um, a huge benefit to our kids. Court is an outstanding counselor, somebody that I'd worked with previously, um, and he's just been uh, a wonderful asset for our kids. Um, Pat Wandra, uh, we hired Pat over from the middle school uh, to teach social studies. He's primarily been teaching global studies. Uh, and then Desiree Wright Rendon, we hired her for social studies as well uh, and brought her over from the Dalles. Uh, we also had some, some individuals um, switch roles. Uh, Lori Hafner moved into uh, the business office to become our business manager. Uh, Mandy Story was our uh, was was our testing coordinator, but she's now um, the role of in the role of secretary. Uh, and then Sarah Wharton be moved into the social studies department as well. You'll actually notice there that our entire social studies department turned over um, uh, this year, which is again, an unusual, but also um, we feel really fortunate that we ended up getting three really, really quality teachers um, in those roles. Um, actually in a lot of ways really, uh, you know, I miss Sarah in the office, but at the same time to get Sarah back in the classroom has been uh, great for the social studies department. It also, I think has been great for our kids too. Um, and I think for her, it's been a good thing as well. Uh, what else is new? I don't know if I'd call it new, but um, continuation and kind of expansion of our one-to-one -one Chromebook program. Uh, you know, we were, we were moving that direction last year um, already. Uh, the pandemic uh, kind of necessitated it obviously, um, but we've done, uh, you know, we did uh, another Chromebook purchase um, bought Chromebooks, um, a, a kind of a new Chromebook, a different Chromebook for our ninth grade class. Um, and we'll cycle those Chromebooks uh, through as new students come in each year. But, um, you know, we're in a lot of ways, we're excited about that program. Um, teachers have really um, latched on to the technology. Uh, you see it used as a, as a great tool in the classroom. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for us, uh, you know, if, I think if you asked our teachers a couple of years ago, do you want to go one to one, they would have probably been skeptical. And now I think after um, last year and then this year, 
um, utilizing it, I don't think they'd, they'd really have any designs to go back. Uh, and then uh, as part of the one-to-one -one program, we are doing more work with Schoology, uh, using it more as a, not just as a, um, as a grade book, but also as a communication tool for parents, as a communication tool for our students, a uh, great way for uh, our counseling office to communicate things, a great way to talk to our senior class about what's happening, what's going on. Um, we, we, you know, obviously if you, if you saw the uh, enrollment report, um, we still have several students who uh, are in the options program. And so Schoology is a way for us to get in touch with those uh, seniors who aren't on campus every day and a way for us to keep them informed of what's going on. So uh, those are some things that are new, some things that we're still, uh, and again, some of them are continuations, but we're trying to take those programs and expand on them. So what are we looking at for next year? One is, again, we're, we really, normalcy is really what we're hoping for. We had to make some adjustments this year. Um, you know, we went to two lunches so that we could reduce the number of kids in the lunchroom um, uh, uh, during that period of time, uh, just to, so that we could uh, help with social distancing. Um, it, but one of the things that it did, you know, I, I, one of the things I feel fortunate about is my staff is very, cohesive. It's a group that really likes to spend time together. And by going to two lunches, lunches is also meant my staff um, had to go to two lunches as well. And um, I'll be honest with you. And I would say that I don't think I've ever been in a, in a building where more teachers liked to be together at lunchtime. Um, you know, that lunchroom was always full. There were very few teachers that weren't down there um, eating lunch together. And so um, that was, you know, those are things that have been challenging for us. And so just having some sense of normalcy, being able to uh, have some assemblies again, and we're working towards maybe doing something second semester um, when things get a little bit, uh, you know, hopefully when things get a little bit safer where we may be able to bring the kids um, together in the gym in a safe way for an assembly. We wanna to try, to try to do some things that um, build community again. You know, I, I think we're starting to see some kids come back to some sporting events and things like that to basketball games. Um, you know, it was funny, the last basketball game we had, uh, the kids actually finally realized that there was a student section for them to sit in. A lot of them didn't realize that that even existed because they just hadn't been to a game in a long time. And so it took a little while for them to realize that, oh, we should all sit here together as, as Elmira High School students. And so, um, you know, we're just really working hard to try to bring those, those normal things back to the high school experience. High school is supposed to be this, you know, fun, exciting time where you get to do things with your friends and um, experience things together as a class. And um, we're really working hard to try to figure out how to make some of those experiences come back for our kids. And I think we're, we're getting closer. Um, we're trying to get as creative as we can so that we do it in a safe way. Um, but we, you know, we know that there's stuff that, that we would normally would have done um, that we need to be able to provide for our kids again. Um, also uh, on the same note, kind of a reemphasis on um, the ninth grade integration and orientation stuff. When I first uh, came, the, the first spring that I was here, um, we had this, all of the eighth graders come over for a, a shadow day. They came for the morning. They got an opportunity to follow around another, uh, a, a ninth grader, kind of spend some time in the classroom, see what that feels like. What's it like to be at Elmira High School? Um, and so that shadow day was important. Uh, you know, we did a, a really great ninth grade fly up that brought a whole lot of people on campus um, that I thought was really, really successful. And it, it, same sort of thing, I, it, we separated it out. So we did some stuff where the, the parents had an opportunity to ask the questions they really wanted to ask. And we, we sent the ninth graders off with students, which is really all they really want to do anyways. They want to hang out with other kids. They don't want to listen to me talk. Um, and so they got an opportunity to visit with other kids to see what high school is really like. And again, that's just something we haven't been able to offer them for the last couple of years. And we're hopeful that in the spring, we're gonna be able to go back to those things. Um, and then on top of that, the ninth grade orientation program that again, we gotten started um, a couple of years ago that we've really had to put on a pause for the last couple of years because of, of COVID. And so, um, you know, I, you know, so everybody, a lot of people say that, you know, high school is sort of, it's driven by their upperclassmen. I don't believe that. I think it's, it's driven by your ninth grade class and how welcome those kids feel and how much, how excited they are to be a part of the high school. And so we need to get back to that. Um, and so we're gonna try to go back to some things that we know was, was working um, and was successful. 
uh, with those with those kids. So we're really working hard on that. In addition, uh, we're also looking at some um, some social and emotional learning curriculum uh, at the high school level. Uh, we've done quite a bit of training. Um, well, I have. I've done quite a bit of training and some PD on in that area. Um, we know that we've got lots of other things going on, so we're trying to um, take some slow steps to move in that direction uh, to give the um, give the staff some support with some social and emotional learning, um, and then then carry that over to our uh, our students. And then also uh, looking at some some other um, practices when it comes to behavior and discipline. Uh, looking at some restorative justice, which is really about how do we reconnect kids with teachers when they've made mistakes in the classroom and how do we get them back in the classroom um, successfully. Um, looking at some positive behavior support, some things that we've, you know, building on some things that we're already doing, but potentially looking at some more formal things um, uh, as well. So really just trying to, to figure out some ways to really celebrate the successes of our kids and de-emphasize some of the mistakes that, that they've made. And, and, you know, I'll be honest with you, there's, 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 there's been some struggles. Kids have definitely had a tough time reintegrating back to regular school. Um, and they've been influenced by lots of different things, whether it's social media, um, whether it's just the fact that I don't remember what it's like to be a student to the fact that I just haven't, you know, I, I've just never been to high school before. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's all really super challenging for kids. And, um, you know, anybody that thought we were going to snap our fingers and say, you know, give them two weeks and they're going to be ready to go and become understand what high school is all about that, you know, I mean, it, it was it was 18 months really of them not having a normal school experience. And it's going to take us a long time. Um, you know, I feel like we've finally settled into a groove now that we're towards the end of the first semester, but it it took us that entire 18 weeks to really get those kids to a place where you look at and go, yeah, this feels kind of like the Elmira High School that I'm used to when I first came here. Um, and a lot of that is just reteaching those things to kids and helping them, you know, just helping them understand this is what it's like to be a high school student. These are the expectations for high school students. This is the behavior that we expect from you. And we're slowly making our way there. And I'm proud of the progress that we've made. Um, we still have work to do. Um, but if I think about what it looked like the first month to where we are today on January 24th, it's a huge difference. Um, and so I'm, I'm proud of where we are, I'm proud of our staff for getting us to where we've gotten to. And we're just going to keep plugging away and keep moving forward um, through the rest of the year. A uh, couple, just a couple pieces of data for you. So, um, you know, despite the struggles, our graduation rate last year was still solid. 91%. Um, and we've consistently been over 90% for a really long time. Um, we And so I'm really proud of the, the work that our teachers did to get those kids there. Um, I'm really proud of the work that our students did to get to that graduation milestone. Um, and I feel really confident that this year's seniors are going to achieve that as well. I, I really strongly believe that we're going to um, we're going to be over 90% this year from a, from a graduation standpoint um, as well. To the point where I know we already have eight to 10 kids uh, that are going to graduate um, and at least finish the requirements. They'll still graduate with us in June, but we have eight to 10 kids that are going to graduate next week. They're done with everything. They're done with their requirements and they're ready to move on. Um, uh, can you pop back there real quick, Michelle? Ninth grade on track. Again, as I said, I was I was disappointed in this number, um, but um, I'm going to be honest. I felt a little better when I saw the state number. This is you know this is something that we're that everybody struggled with. Um, ninth grade on track was was a challenge last year, and lots and lots of lots and lots of schools had lots and lots of kids, uh, particularly ninth graders, that had a hard time engaging. And I think that was the thing that we found was, despite our best efforts, despite phone calls and emails and check-ins and as many different ways as we could to try to connect with kids. We had some kids that throughout digital learning never engaged. And so when you don't engage for an entire semester and you have an, and, and there's an opportunity to earn four credits and you don't earn any of them, you're, you're not going to be on track to graduate. You're not going to be on track after your ninth grade year. And we had several kids that, that now they're here, they're back, they're in school, 
they're doing, they're doing better. And we're trying to find ways to get those kids some, make up some of the credits that they lost, but also get them in a spot um, where they're, you know, where they just feel comfortable and that they're used to having some success at school again. And I think that's part of what we're trying to achieve, but this number is not what we want it to be. Um, but again, once, once I kind of compared how we did to the state, um, I, I did feel better because it was, it was clear that it was not just an Elmira high school issue. This was something that everybody was dealing with last year, try to get those kids who in many cases um, hadn't really, in some cases hadn't really engaged in school since March of their seventh grade year involved with what was going on at the high school level. That's a tough, you know, that's a tough haul um, and a tough ask for some of those kids. All right, um, some things that are coming up. Uh, the semester unbelievably is over. Um, three more days, uh, one more day of kind of just some review and finish up. And then uh, a couple of days of final exams and then we're moving to semester two. Um, you know, I think our teachers are excited about um, seeing some new classes, some new kids. I think our kids are excited to have some change in their schedule as well. So there's some excitement that the semester is um, winding down and we're moving towards semester two. Uh, spring sports, another thing that just is already creeping up on us five weeks away from baseball, softball and, and track. Um, and I'll, you know, if I'm being honest, I'm excited to go back outside again and, and have um, sports outdoors and be able to get kids outside and um, hopefully we'll get nice weather this spring and get a chance to get out there and do some things. Um, if you haven't had a chance, we are doing, you know, we have home basketball tomorrow night. We've got home wrestling on Wednesday night. Um, our kids are, are working really hard. Our coaches are doing a good job um, helping them um, persevere through what's been a challenging winter. Um, but we're, you know, we're excited for what they've done. Um, we're also excited for those, you know, if you weren't aware, um, the reclassification committee uh, met. I was part of that committee. Um, and uh, we're going to be um, transitioning to the 3A level next year, which I think is going to be a really good thing for our programs. We get to play against schools that look like us um, rather than have to continuously play Marist and Cottage Grove and Marshfield and North Bend and some of those schools that, uh, you know, that are just, they're just challenging for us to, to compete against and be successful. So um, Crestwell looks like us, Harrisburg looks like us, Pleasant Hill looks like us, and we get to be in a league with those schools and we're, we're excited for that. Um, prom is happening Saturday, April 30th. We're uh, super excited to return to a, a normal um, prom environment. We did have a dance uh, back in December. Um, we had a winter formal, which uh, went, went really, really well. The kids had a great time. Uh, I can honestly say I've never seen that many Elmira High School kids at a dance ever. Um, and I think it was just excitement on their part that we got to have another have a dance again. Um, there were 250 kids that showed up for that dance and it was, it was a ton of fun. The DJ did a great job and the kids had a great time. So um, we uh, will also do something called home going week, which is a, a week to say goodbye to our seniors um, and a chance for kind of one last spirit week um, that we'll do some dress ups and maybe and have, try to have a, an assembly. Um, ninth grade fly up is scheduled for Tuesday, May 31st. Uh, so we're excited to um, invite those parents and kids onto campus again. We will have a dance for homegoing on that Friday night. It's just, just an, a very informal in the cafeteria, um, maybe even in the outside courtyard if the weather is nice enough dance where the kids can just kind of have one last opportunity, particularly to say goodbye to the seniors because the following week the seniors are, are wrapping up, taking um, some exams and doing some grad practice. Uh, awards night, uh, Tuesday the 7th of June. Um, I am really, really hopeful we're going to be able to do that in person. We've done, we've gone virtual the last two years. My goal is to do awards night in person, um, and then graduation Friday, June 10th. Um, we'll be working on plans for graduation, whether that's an inside event like it has been in the past, or whether we go with what we did last year, which was an outdoor event. Um, we're still working on plans for that, um, and we'll finalize those plans probably sometime in February. Uh, and then last day of school, February or it's Friday, June 17th. So um, it'll get on us as it'll get on us very quickly. So, um, last real quick slide, just to th again, a thank you, um, our ESSA team, myself, uh, Emmy Irwin, Miss Tom Edmondson, Deborah St. Hilaire, James Monaghan, Barbara is on that team, uh, Mandy Story, uh, and then Clyde Olsby and Tristan Harsh. Clyde is our ASB president. Tristan is our senior class president. Um, we just want to thank all of you for your, uh, service to Elmira High School and to the Fernridge School District. And I will 
uh, in there and ask if you have any questions. Thank you, Rick. What questions do we have, Board? I just wanna thank you for all of, not only your hard work, but all of the staff's hard work. Uh, I know that high school students can be particularly challenging at times. And um, I really appreciate how much effort you're putting in to make sure that they're getting what they need, not only to succeed academically, but also health physically and mentally. Yep. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I think we've, you know, we're, we're working really, really hard to help figure out how to help our kids be successful. And I just want to echo that we all know that those of you that are in the school buildings are that like, you know, the, the boots on the ground, so to speak. And um, I can't imagine doing your job right now. And I'm just so glad that you continue to show up um, really every you know, every day for the kids and to figure out what we're not doing that we could be and what we're not doing that we should be. And, and it's, it's been, you know, really an honor to, you know, in my position as chair, I get a lot of back-end emails that I get copied in on. And I've been so amazed this year at how much compassion and how much just real dedication to what we can do for our students, um, I see in those emails. So I just wanna thank you for that as well. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I have a, a 10th grader that's never been inside the high school as a high school student. So we're, we're looking forward to, to that being able to happen as well. Well, we're looking forward um, to having her. So thankful that you're aware that that's a problem and that not all, you know, that, they, that, that you and the staff know that, you, you know, that there are kids that are struggling. And, and like you said, it's not just here and it's not just in Oregon. I mean, everybody in, in the country and everyone in the world is dealing with the fallout from, from the last two years. So um, thanks for, for, for showing up and, and please extend to your entire staff. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll let, I will let them know. Thank you. And, and I'll try to write something coherent um, <laughs> when, when I'm able to do that. All right. Um, moving along. And I don't have any idea. Oh, superintendent's report. All right. Well, Rick, you made that kind of a hard act to follow, but Gary, it's all you now. Well, I'll be short and sweet. I've talked enough tonight. A uh, couple things I wanted to go over just to recognition of our school board because it's January and it's school board appreciation month. So thanks to Michelle for helping coordinate our uh, efforts here. Hopefully you got a little elf came by today and uh, got to see you. So thanks again, appreciate all of your volunteer work. Um, really quickly, uh, wanted to note that in February, Ms. Marshall is gonna be doing a quick update um, on our ESSER and SIA plans. Uh, both of them have been submitted and approved uh, we have lots more still to do with equity, social emotional learning, and professional development, uh, but we have a plan um, and expect to kind of update on those two plans, SIA and ESSER, uh, in February. Uh, and then finally, just a quick, you know, just the day before winter break, uh, OHA released a bunch of new COVID-related guidelines. Um, the single biggest things, I would say, that were the changes were the staff uh, definition of up-to-date and vaccination, which requires a booster. Um, it's not required for employment, but it is required uh, if you're not gonna be a close contact. So that's definitely affected schools around uh, Oregon and that more staff um, are becoming close contacts uh, if their two shot initial series occurred longer than six months ago. For students, it did not change. Uh, if they were vaccinated at all, they are uh, still, if they're a close contact, just need to monitor for symptoms. Um, and then the other significant change was around close contacts. They know that, especially in, with this new uh, variant and the number of cases in the communities and around and, you know, being exchanged in athletics, 
uh, and a lot of off school uh, activities where there aren't uh, as stringent of requirements has really exploded things in just the managing of informing, calling, uh, I think also combined with just the, just the way it spreads and the seriousness of the disease, they have uh, changed what defines a close contact. And it's really now limited to um, times when you're uh, unmasked in school. So for us, that's athletics, uh, after school, uh, and lunchtime. So that has helped pare down, uh, you know, a workload there. So those were the, those were just a couple of the more significant changes. I'm sure there will be lots more to come. And there was a lot of other smaller changes in that update, but uh, those are some of the key ones. So that's all I have for tonight, unless anybody has any questions. Okay. Hearing no questions, I'm gonna call on you again because we have a discussion about the trees, I believe. Ah, trees, yes. So, well, I can't see them out my window now because it's pitch black, but in the front of the middle school property on the south property line closer to territorial are five extremely large trees. Um, and like, I don't know if I ballpark them they're 150 feet tall. Yeah. Uh, and um, the neighbor uh, to us is concerned. There's been a couple of storms recently, most recent ice storm a year ago, wind storm recently. And one of these trees fell or even one of their larger limbs would literally go through their house. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the trees were healthy. We called in an arborist, uh, he did an inspection and I believe I shared that with you. Uh, his recommendation is that they're removed, that they are not healthy. Um, so it's nothing that needs board approval. However, uh, it is something I wanted to give you an opportunity to provide input on. I did get a second opinion from uh, the mayor of No Tide, Justin Wartenby. Uh, I had him come out as somebody that works around trees all day long. Uh, and he agreed that they got some significant issues. Um, so uh, our plan would be, um, we've got a bid to take them out, uh, just under $10,000, uh, but that doesn't include removal or dealing with them. Uh, I would need to go through, uh, it's kind of dependent on the value of the tree and we won't really know when, until they hit the ground. You know, are they just rotten and there's something a sawmill won't even take? Um, and talking to Justin, who again, delivers trees to sawmills every day, um, he said, yeah, and sometimes I won't even take trees like this on public property just for the potential of nails or spikes to be in them. Um, but we'll make that determination. If they get down and they are something that um, we could sell, uh, get delivered to um, a mill, they buy the trees, then we just have a source of revenue. Um, it certainly won't be much. Another option would be to uh, donate them if they really don't have any value to a local uh, nonprofit that may be interested in making firewood or selling them. I, I reached out to a couple, uh, Babe Ruth being one of them, local uh, nonprofit, um, and there'll probably be some others. There, there'll be a, it'll be a lot of firewood. Uh, so if we go that route, but anyways, I just wanted to get it on your radar. Uh, nothing you need to do unless you have concerns. Like I said, I was pretty clear from the arborist what his recommendation was and I think Knowing that we're at some, you know, when a tree falls, uh, which happens, it's an act of God, and you know, we're, we're not, we don't have any liability of us. However, now that we know that these trees are unhealthy um, and being recommended to be taken out, that does put some liability on us, and so I'd recommend that we move forward and remove them. Again, nothing uh, you need to act on. I'm just letting you know what I'm doing. But if you had concerns, I'd certainly listen to them now. What kind of timeline do we have for that? Goal would be spring break. It'd be such a dip uh, uh, disruption there to the front of the school. So oh, goal yeah. Be, <laughs> yes. yes. Goal would okay. be to take them down uh, over spring break, and then uh, we'll see how quickly we can get them out of there. Okay. Um, do we have alternative plans for like parking and drop off and everything else? If or. Yeah, no, not yet. No, so okay. Once I kind of know that this is definitely the path we'll go in. Well, I don't, I have no idea if, you know, these five trees will be on the ground in four hours or four days. Okay. Um, so I'll kind of get that timeline. And then if it's looking like I'm going to need to 
make some adjustments that next week at the middle school, we'll do that. Okay. All right, keep us posted. Um, any other questions before we move on? Don't see anybody. All right. Um, we were gonna talk about a listening session. This was an idea that I um, floated to Gary. He said that I could bring it up to the board. So um, as most of you know, um, I've been taking advantage of all of the webinar trainings that uh, Oregon School Board Association has to offer because Mark Boren did this job for so long and so well that I wanna make sure that I'm able to somewhat adequately fill his shoes, which is hard because he has much larger feet than I do. So, um, so I've been spending every month uh, one hour on Wednesday with the other chairs of other school boards throughout the state. And one of the things that we have all um, noticed, felt, is that our communities don't feel like we're listening. Um, and part of that, I think, is because our meetings are public, this is where we're supposed to do our work, and that is to stop us from, you know, padding our pockets or doing something that would be really um, unethical as board members. It's to stop, you know, the board from deciding that we're gonna take all of the district's money and go to Hawaii. That, that's the whole purpose behind like public meeting law, sunshine law is, is that when public entities are doing their decision-making, they do it in public so that the people can witness it. Um, it's not supposed to be an opportunity for a question and answer period or a conversation. And so I feel often like as the chair, very uncomfortable because something is read or someone speaks and then we still have this work to do because we don't do work anytime other than right here. So if you don't see us do it or see us approve it, it's not getting done. We're not doing it. We're not, we're, we're not, we're not meeting behind closed doors. We're not having discussions otherwise. Um, this, is when, this is when and where we do our work. And so one of the things that other districts have come up with as a, not a solution necessarily, but as a step towards that is holding a listening session, which is a separate board meeting. The districts that I had heard from had done it uh, virtually so that they didn't have to worry about um, keeping people out of a room or counting how many people are in a room or counting distance from chairs or anything like that. And then anyone who wanted to participate could. They kept the same three minute um, limit. Most of them met for about an hour. Um, via Zoom and people uh, came in, they were, they, they, they were allowed to speak for three minutes and, and then the next person was up. Um, I can tell you that of the boards that I heard, none of them seemed to think that it like solved all of their problems or sense of division within the community. Um, all of them said that they felt like they learned a lot um, and two of them were gonna do it again and, and a third said um, never again. <laughs> They weren't interested, but it didn't. It didn't seem to really like solve any problems or offer any solutions. But I know that it's uncomfortable for me as someone who wants the community to feel that we are listening, who believes very strongly in the work that we do here, and believes very strongly in this district in particular, to feel like I am blowing people off or not addressing their concerns. Um, the other piece that's frustrating for us as board chairs that we talked about is just the idea that people, um, that, that we're kind of getting blamed for decisions that are being made outside of our pay grade, so to speak, and, um, you know, or just so, so far over our head that it's not really legal for us to act on some of these things that we're being asked to act on um, as board members. And so I know that trying to adequately communicate that to people who don't feel heard is going to be challenging. But I wanted to throw out for the board whether or not holding a uh, listening session or discussion might be um, appropriate or, or something that we would want to do uh, within the community. And then as I was thinking about this getting ready for the meeting and then when Jessica was sharing earlier about the division in our community and, and how frustrating that is and even I think she said even going at, you know, to basketball games, it just seems, feels like people are not coming together the way that they used to. Um, she mentioned a community survey and then Gary mentioned a community survey. So it might be that that would be a way to go 
instead or in addition or before, maybe before we hold a listening session, we'd like to hold a community survey and then identify topics from there that we ask to hear from the, the community about, or, or maybe we don't wanna do a, you know, a listening session. I just wanted to throw that out there to the board members and, uh, and hear what you have to say. And I'm gonna mute myself and be quiet and listen to you. I, I would be, um, I would definitely be in favor of a listening session, um, but not necessarily, I wouldn't want it to be um, presented as a question and answer because so many of the public's questions we can't necessarily answer no they need to go know. to gary i mean that you know he, he's right. the one that can answer a lot of those questions and that's the other the other frustration and and we're not you know none of us are alone in in that and gary you do an excellent job of answering the questions when they when they come to you and many of these are yes. things that happen above your pay grade as well i don't want it to seem like i'm blaming but um, so you'd, I, it's, what I'm hearing, Andrea, is you would be in favor of holding a listening session with the understanding that really publicizing that what we're doing is we're just listening. We're here to hear. We're not going to be able to answer or address concerns, but we do want to hear from our constituents, yes. so to speak, from our community. Um, yes, okay. definitely. I, I would, and I do want to hear from our community. Um, Me too. I would agree. I think it'd be nice to, you know, instead of um, seeing comments and statements about the district on social media to actually have a face with people um, somewhat face to face, even if it is Zoom um, and have them come on and voice their concerns. Um, you know, I, I agree that it should not be a question and answer just because most of the stuff that they're commenting on or the statements that are making or questions are operational things, not policy. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would be in favor of, of doing a listening session as long as it has the same requirements as any other public comment that we have at our normal business meetings. Okay, thank you, Mark. Jackie or Barb? Barbara? Um, for me, I think, I mean, the frustration that we have heard so many times will be repeated. And the fact that we're not able to answer the questions, they, the perception would be that we're passing the buck, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm concerned about that. And um, I don't have a problem if the group decide that's the way we're going. I, I, I fully support it, but I'm concerned that we won't really solve anything at that point. And there will be more frustration with us sitting there, whether in person or not, and not being able to answer the questions that they're coming with. Um, and I, I know I had kind of spoken with Gary about this as well. And like I mentioned, several of the boards that tried this did not, I mean, no one said, oh yeah, now the community has come together and we're all working for the common good and we understand opposing viewpoints and you know and like that that hasn't happened um certainly one can hope but i i agree with you that that could be a potential downfall i want to be clear i thought this might be something that we might want to try but it it's not up to me to make decisions for the board either which is part of why i you know, wanted to bring it for discussion um, the other thing I want to say is that I have been at every one of Gary's Q&A sessions, which is a question and answer session, which is about operational day-to-day -day stuff. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've attended every one of those. And today, I think we had two or three um, parents who, who are also here now. And thank you for showing up for both of those meetings. But it is frustrating to have people wanting us to engage with them and then not arriving not being able to attend or not attending those those q a sessions where they can actually have their questions answered by by the person who can answer them so 
So that is one of the risks for sure, Barb, of, of being there and, and having people still be frustrated and still feel like we're not um, listening to them, even, even if we're, you know, doing everything that we can to listen. Um, Jackie, do you have any, anything to add? Okay, I'm glad I was able to unmute this time. I keep hitting the wrong button. Um, so I would echo Barbara. Um, I think this is a really frustrating time. I mean, I'm frustrated all the time um, with COVID. I'm so sick of it, I can't even tell you. Um, however, I still wear my mask and, um, and I still do what I'm supposed to do. Um, not that I like it, but no one asked me if I liked it. Um, and I think, you know, today I was looking at um, the information that Gary and Michelle and everybody gave us. And I thought the community q and I wanted to kind of beam in on that um, and listen to that. And I don't want to redo or recreate what we already have. I mean, I feel like it's important to recognize what a board can do. And this is an education process for me also, um, because I come from a staff background and now I'm trying to be a board member. Um, so it's always important, I think, and having been in the schools that people go through the appropriate chain of command with their frustrations. Um, if they have a frustration with their teacher, go to the teacher. If they don't get satisfaction with that, go to the principal. If they don't get satisfaction with that, I hear Gary say time and time again, he has an open door, which I congratulate him for because I cannot believe his door is always so open with as much as this guy's got on his plate. I was going to make a joke about having no hair, but I think I will, I'll, I'll refrain from that, Gary. Um, um, but but um, so there's a lot of vehicles for this. And I think for me, I don't want to make people feel like we're lame ducks by coming and they vent and there's not really, that is really not like the um, procedure things that was um, that were in that one letter today were really issues that Gary needed to deal with and address, um, not the board. I mean, we deal with approving policy, looking at the enrollment reports. Um, so I would like to be part of the Q&A sessions um, when he does that. I'm pretty interested in that actually. And I do, you know, I wanna hear what people have to say. Um, it's not like I'm not interested, but I'm limited as to what I can do to solve things. Because typically with a bunch of frustration and anger or um, things aren't working away the way that someone would like, I would have to turn that over to Gary. Um, so I want to empower the people that we work for, for in the best way. And I, maybe I think, um, attending the Q&A sessions that Gary runs might be the best way to do that and encourage people to attend those. But I, you know, I'll I do can it. tell you that, I'm sorry, when, when I've been on those, if there is something that comes up that falls under like the board umbrella, Gary refers to me and says, you know, Tiana, is it, can you speak on behalf of the board towards this? And if I can, I do. And if I can't, then I come talk to you guys. And then I do next time I'm asked, but um, you know, during the Q and A sessions, if there is something that is like a specific board question that's really in our wheelhouse and under what we are legally able to do, then then you know we are able to answer. So it would be great to have you join. Um, I think it's the Monday of the board meeting at five thirty every month. I am I still on? Yeah. Man, I hate this computer. <laughs> um, I I would I would I would like to do that. I would really like to do that. I. Um, as with everyone else, you know, I feel reasonably isolated um, in in listening to people and trying to be safe at the same time. I mean, that's really the thing. Um, I can't, you know, I don't want to spread COVID. I don't want to get COVID. Um, but I do want to be responsive to our public and our community. Um, and I want to do that the best way possible. That's all I, 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 you know, I really agree with both Jackie and Barbara, but I would also, um, I think there's no reason that we can't do a special meeting <clears throat> if people are available. Um, if there's going to be three or more of us at one of those Q&As, we probably should be a public meeting anyway. If we're all three there, technically we're three we're together as a board. Uh, just make it a public meeting the next time or every time. And, um, you know, we, we have, if we do that, we have to have a quorum to actually 
making decisions, which we won't anyway, because it's a listening session. Um, but, uh, and then just, you know, it'll be part of the Q and A at 5.30 um, for an hour and then adjourn that meeting and go into our regular meeting. It wouldn't be that much different than, you know, any other type of special meeting that we might have, like the, the retreat, for instance, or something like that. So, but the special meeting would be just for the Q and A where Gary would answer the questions if it has to do with something uh, a board, um, that the board uh, actually deals with, then, you know, Tiana can um, speak to that if she chooses to for the board or, um, you know, get a hold of that person later on after it's something that we discuss as a board instead of trying to discuss it there. Um, so I think that'd be one possible way of doing it without having to do a special meeting on some other night. I don't know if Gary is willing to do that or not, but I don't see why it would matter. It wouldn't be any different than what he's doing now. Just the board members would be in attendance to listen to what all the board members, if possible, would be in attendance. Well, and we would be giving up the half hour pre-meeting meeting that time. Um, but I think we could cover that elsewhere if need be. Gary, do you have thoughts? Um, yeah, the, well, first of all, whatever you guys prefer, I'm on board. Um, the, but it would be different because the Q and A, we don't allow people to speak. Everybody's muted. They're just typing in questions. If I don't have a good response, I screenshot it. I get back to them the next day. I let them know, hey, we got this question. Um, not that we couldn't change, but that's the way the Q and A works. They're, everybody's just typing in a question. I'm scrolling down through them. I guess my only, my only um, uh, thought about the, the listening session is we have a listening session. Every board meeting night, it's exactly the same. If your listening session is gonna be three minutes and you don't respond, we have that every month in our board meeting. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, we, we tr are trying to respond a little bit, not just listen and be quiet and say, okay, next agenda item, but like tonight, you know, uh, give a little bit of information and let's move on. And if you did a listening session, I would strongly discourage that because that, that'll just create a, a back and forth, Q and A, a dialogue. And that isn't what that would be about. I'd really encourage if you do go to a listening session, that that's exactly what it is, three minutes. Um, uh, you know, not that somebody can't go to three minutes and 22 seconds, uh, but keep it short that there isn't any response. Next person, there's going to be people saying you're doing a great job. There's going to be people saying, uh, you know, we're all crazy uh, and just listen to it. But I guess, again, my, my reservation would be we afford that opportunity with a little bit of a response every board meeting night anyhow. Okay. Um, well, I didn't, I, I wasn't asking for board action, just kind of want to, to think of people's uh, or get people's thoughts on that. Um, One thing that I think might help is um, I will, well, A, we, we've got some tweaks we need to make to this policy because a few people were confused tonight um, and didn't uh, follow that protocol correctly. So the other thing is, you know, I try to get out the community Q&A stuff the day of the meeting because I know people share it on social media rather than the Wednesday before or the third and then they forget. But over the course of the next month, what I would propose is that we, I, not we, uh, us here at the district office really try to promote this new policy, how people can provide input, that it's here's when our board meeting is, here's the link, and try to do that weekly leading up to that February board meeting and do the same thing for the Q&A and see if we can get a lot more participation, particularly in the Q&A, you know, when, uh, you know, a board meeting, yeah, I, I can make my three minute statement, but there isn't a lot of response in the Q&A. Um, they can, they can get a response. Uh, so, you know, it's just much more efficient, at least, I, I think, in my mind, there was a question in the, uh, I got a question, I don't know if everybody can see these questions or not. Assuming the Q&A will be in person. Yeah, I've never done, a, I don't think my Q and A's will ever be in person because the point is to engage people. If I did it in person, you know, if there was, if I did it tonight and in person, there probably would have been nobody there, but I did it virtually and we had three plus seven staff members for, you know, a total of nine or 10 people. I think my community Q and A's will always be virtual simply because I think it increases the likelihood I'm gonna get more people there to ask questions. Um, but that's just the plan for now. Um, we'll see. So, all right, I'm muted. Uh, I so, so, go ahead, Jackie. Go ahead. 
No, go. I, well, I was going to ask Gary a question. You can finish what you were saying. Oh, I just, I, I'd be in favor of, of maybe waiting to see if we do get more response to the new policy and um, the Q and A if it's advertised just a little bit more and hopefully gets out to people more. I mean, I, you know, I don't think we're going to get a hundred people at a Q and A or a listening session, but we'll probably get, you know, the same ten to twenty people that are um, either on tonight or that are the ones um, making comments in, um, in, public, in, in the public comment or on social media that we normally get the 10 to 20 um, out of all the parents that we have in the district. And it'll probably be about the same people. Hopefully we'll get more. Um, and hopefully the comments will be both positive and then also some constructive, some constructive criticism also. Um, but we'll see. So I'd be more in favor of holding off a month to and then talk about it again at the board meeting next month to discuss whether we want to do a separate listening session. Okay, Jackie. So I think that's, um, I, I agree with Mark. Um, and um, Gary, can you just review quickly um, what that Q&A session will typically look like. So people have to submit, submit, submit questions ahead of time, and then you respond to them. There's not really an active dialogue that goes on, or how's that work? No, working? it's like a Zoom meeting, Jackie, and you can type questions into the chat window instead of raising your hand or speaking. So he just keeps everybody but the speaker muted, but he answers the questions as they come up in the chat window. So people are able to ask live questions. They're just not talking over each other. Okay, because I think probably, I could be wrong, but um, I think probably um, the frustration that we're hearing from some of the people is that they read their concerns and then we move on to other board mm -hmm. business. But since you have that Q&A session, I mean, that would be an opportunity for them to get um, some kind of dialogue going and some direct answers to questions as you're moving through things um, that maybe aren't board related um, and maybe getting that information more out. And the, whatever, you know, the so folks, um, I would, I was just saying the folks that I'm are sorry, there, go ahead. Ask good questions. You know, there's always uh, mm -hmm. usually the folks that are there um, ask a question or two. They're always good questions. Um, usually I've tried to have touch base on two to four topics and spend less than five minutes. Uh, so that I have the rest of the half hour, 25 minutes to just take questions. And tonight, you know, we were done 15 minutes in because there was only a, only two or three, three questions asked, but uh, yeah, that's, that's the I mean, way they really work. The letter we received today to the board, um, if that was addressed to the Q and A session, um, that could have even gone into more detail during that period of time. For sure. um, yeah. Yeah. I, and I thought it was great. You were responding to it. So um, you know, that might be the answer to having more dialogue. That's my two cents. So then um, it sounds like Jackie and Mark would be for just waiting and trying to um, do a better job of sharing information or, or, or really kind of advertising our new pro uh, procedures and the Q&A session itself. And then um, more board members than just me will show up next month to the Q&A session. Is that what I'm hearing kind of as a somewhat I will. Of, sure yeah I, I'll be yeah, happy to sure. show up I just have to get it on my calendar because I'm always working right up until <laughs> right until I have right. to come to the board meeting so. well, we'll, we'll make sure it gets on your calendar and I just okay. like to make it clear that I just like to make it clear no matter how we do it if we show up to the, the Q&A or if we have a separate listening session it's not going to be a back and forth, not an answer to ask a question, the board answered, ask a question, the board answered. That's not the way it works. I mean, that's just not, we're not going to get into, um, you know, a back and forth with somebody about what, you know, they believe should be happening and the way things are going to happen. So, I mean, no matter how we do it, I mean, Gary will answer their questions, but if they, they could ask another question, a follow-up or whatever through the chat room, uh, through the chat feature, but it's not going to be a confrontation at all. That's just not going to happen. So no matter how we do it, whether we put it off I, for a month or we put it off for six months, no matter what, they're not going to get that back and forth with the board. It's not the way we yeah. conduct our business. 
earlier this year, I attended some of the early Q and A's and I just was a fly on the wall. Um, but I felt like I got more of a sense of, um, you know, the nitpicky questions that people were wondering about and, and Gary's responses. And um, I don't know, that just kind of fell off my radar, my calendar. And um, I, I'm going to put it back on. And, uh, but I agree with you, Mark. I, I don't want anyone to expect that they're going to, um, they're going to have a confrontation with, with any of us. <laughs> okay. Um, so next month, listening or not listening session, Q and A, and we board members will be there listening, like like a fly on the wall. Unless something comes up that's board related, and then and then you're welcome to point them in my direction, Gary. Um, Thanks for engaging in this conversation with me. I, I sometimes hear things at these meetings and I'm like, oh, I should take that to the board. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I get to take that to the board. And other times I'm like, oh, we should talk about this. I hope they don't all like throw things at me for, for <laughs> suggesting it, but but let's, let's figure out how we can maybe address this. So um, moving on, we have personnel. I move that we uh, approve the hiring of both uh, the health teacher and the special education teacher at Elmira High School. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries five to zero. And we have non-licensed personnel. <laughs> you can always see me, Michelle. I'm just—it's uh, what almost fifty looks like, apparently. Um, all right, Sabrina Cox, Kelsey Boren. Michelle, can you make that bigger? I can hardly see it. I—I I don't know if it's what I'm doing on my screen. Maybe I'll—I'll I'll put my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> we have the technology. <laughs> I have three pairs of glasses and I can never find the right one. No, I don't know what's going on here. I shrunk this and I can't get it back. Oh, I hate that. Okay. And this does not require board action. It's just letting us know we hired Sabrina Fox uh, as a SPED instru uh, instructional assistant at middle school. Kelsey Boren as a regular instructional assistant. Uh, oh, she's moving. She's transferring from regular to special education at VES. And uh, Robert Cantwell resigned and we hired Pat Wondra. All right. And I feel like there's other things down at the bottom. This is usually towards the end, but maybe not. Nope. Late or closing uh, items or comments from anyone on the board? So I just um, want to... Uh, uh, respond to one of the comments that the uh, that Jessica um, said that um, that board members are sending their their children to other districts, and um, I'm pretty sure that you aren't Tiana, and I. No, I am. I, I'm sure. I'm sure that's about me, and I am under the advice of my medical team, whose advice I have followed the entire 684 days that I kept my family home. And it's not something that we can change out here. It has to do with- um, I apologize. A, a, a I, medical I, situation. No, it, it, it is. I know that it was pointed at me. Um, I'm doing what I have to do to get my kids into school, and it has been an enormous grieving process for me because I have worked with 457 school districts across the country, and Fernridge has by far the best administrators, teachers, and instructional staff, um, and I would say 
all the way to facilities, all the way to tech, everyone that I have worked with in this district has been A plus, and it's been a really, really challenging decision to make. These are people who know my kids and people who I trust with my kids. And I'm following, you know, as I've talked to Gary over and over again, I'm just doing what I've been doing since March 3rd of 2020, which is following my medical team's medical advice for my terminally ill child. So and I am so people sorry. can judge I, me if they want, but I'm I'm gonna I, I still have uh, one child that's still out here and I'm gonna stay until somebody else steps up and really wants it. And um, I believe in the work that we're doing and it's an honor to work with these people. And I wish that the global health situation that that doesn't threaten most children, that, that it is just a bad cold, if that for most children, but is a threat to my son's life, wasn't a thing that any of us were dealing with. And I wish nothing more than to be like sitting next to, to, to Jackie in the boardroom, uh, telling her jokes right before we get started. That That is like the life that I would like to get back to as well. So, so I heard that, I understand it. Um, I'm, I'm making a different choice as of right now because I believe in the work that we're doing and I'm following medical advice. So if, if I don't think that takes away the from the, the work you do. So you shouldn't need to apologize for that. That's Thank my you. personal opinion. It doesn't take away from what you do and the time you volunteer and give off freely. So Thank you, know you have our support. And I absolutely support you. I And I'm really sorry that I, oh, and I bumbled I'm, into that. I no, it's true. It's a, I mean, it's a thing. Me. It's true, and I, I wasn't gonna. I don't want to. I don't want to seem uh, defensive, but it is something that has deeply affected our lives. And you know, people are complaining about what their kids can and can't do in school. But my children have not been able to be in a school building yet, and I am so excited to get them back with friends of any kind, back in an opportunity where they can do that social emotional learning, where they can hopefully recover from some of their depression and anxiety where I can work on recovering from some of my own. So I, I you know, it, it, we all do what we have to do for our families and um, that's what I'm doing. So anyway, <laughs> I, sh I should have being... given you a heads up, Andrea. It's all good. <laughs> Thank so, you so Tiana, just up front. <laughs> So, and Tiana, no one ever wants to sit next to me in a meeting. So don't ever say that because <laughs> I wiggle too much. Well, namaste. Let me and say, me neither. No one, no one ever wants to sit next to me. They're like, sit still. Well, the other thing I just want to, I want to say is thank you for the accolades we got from the community and oh. from staff today. I was very touched. I, I don't know why exactly, because I know everyone's, we have such a great staff, but I thought it was so nice that Michelle came to our house and she oh, had yeah. all this stuff and it was like yeah. stuff directed towards me like Snoopy and it was very <laughs> cute. So thank you everybody. That was great. Absolutely. That's all thank you. Yes, and thank Michelle you has been a lifeline much. this entire time. I, I, I could definitely not have done that without her. So thank you, Michelle. I would, just like right. also, I would just also like to say thank you for all the, the stuff that we got from the staff and administrators. And, and um, it was great, even though um, Jackie is at school is uh, Benita Elementary, I did get a bunch of nice cards from Miss Pepper's uh, first grade class. And uh, um, simply because I do have a family member that had worked in that class um, prior uh, to today or this week. And so I just, it was great. I was able to go on to a Zoom meeting with that class and uh, thank them for the, for the great little notes that they passed along, which are just so cute. And I was able to read them one of my favorite books. And so um, over Zoom, of course, but it's not quite as good as in person, but um, I understand that uh, hopefully um, before the end of the year, I can actually go in person and, and thank them personally and and read a couple other of my favorite books to them so uh, it just it's great to, to see the appreciation for you know a job that we don't really get anything for um and that we're doing um uh, because we do really do care about the kids no matter what people think so yeah um so thank <laughs> you to all the staff and administrators and i really appreciate it too excellent well thank you everyone for being here uh, hearing nothing else, I will adjourn this meeting. Meeting adjourned. Thanks.